fun with it about this. So I think most of this is true. Uh, <laughs> it's true in my mind. Don uh, has had a lifelong interest in nature from his boyhood in rural Indiana to the present day. He holds a PhD in chemistry and has extensive knowledge on a wide range of subjects. He has expert knowledge of flora and fauna in our area. His two acre home gardens he constructed from the ground up in Montgomery County are an inspiration to anyone who has seen them. <laughs> the number of host and nectar native plants in his garden is astounding. Each fall he tags monarchs and then has a release of monarchs and other butterflies at his home in Lake Windcrest subdivision. He has written several articles published by Pomona and is active in the local organization. He leads the native Committee for Mercer Botanic Gardens. He is a botanic advisor to our chapter. Don is someone who knows a great deal on many subjects, and yet he comes across as just a great guy that's a lot of fun to be around. Okay. <laughs> okay I'll go with that. We could not have a better person to kick off our chapter meeting, so please give warm, uh, Don a warm welcome. How sweet is that? That was very nice. Hey, John, you have a twin? Uh, <laughs> someone, he's, he's not here tonight. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the one that Mike was mentioned, yeah. yeah I, I showed I up that. instead. <laughs> so that's the way it is. Thanks, this Josh. Just, just forward and backwards. Forward and backwards. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, well, I just put a collage of butterflies that you might see around here. These are, these are some I've taken photographs of around it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why you should use native plants, how to, how to build a garden with native plants for butterflies, and then a little bit about which plants are the best. So uh, I hope that when you know we finish up here that you'll have a, a little bit of a understanding. I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, so I don't think I really need to do this. But, but anyhow, this is, a, this is our kickoff, so we'll see where we go from here. Um, you may have seen this article recently in the, the Chronicle, the Houston yeah. Chronicle. This was in uh, July or August, I guess it was August. Uh, no, July 26th. Uh, that, was, that was when this came about. Uh, it says that monarchs are endangered. Well, they're not really endangered. They're not on the U.S. endangered species list because they're not endangered going extinct. But the, the migration is kind of in trouble because it's typically dropped below the 300 million butterflies that they say is the critical size that they need for the herd to make it back and forth and not be threatened. So they're, they're, in, they're in a little bit of trouble, but they're not alone because since 1970, 50% of the insect population in the U.S. has disappeared. And along with that, since 1970, 50% of the songbird population has disappeared. You kind of wonder why? Well, the mother birds have to feed their chicks something. And what do they feed them? They feed them the caterpillars from all the all the insects. So without those little little insects, you lose the birds too. So it's it's getting to be kind of a messy thing. But anyhow, the monarchs are not alone in this. Uh, it's it's pretty much everything. Uh, you wonder, you know, what's going on? Well, this is the monarch flyway up near where my wife grew up. Haskell, Texas. This is the Central Texas Flyway, where they all have to funnel down through as they come to the Midwest with the Corn Belt. So they come down here, and this is what they see. This is this is modern farm. It's an agribusiness now. It's not like it was 50 years ago when I was younger, uh, much younger. Uh, it was then we had fence rows between the fields. Now the farms are so big, there are no fence rows. It goes from roadside to roadside, and so it's planted and tilled right up to the road. There are no spots in between. And then to top it all off, in the 1970s, Roundup came into being. And then Roundup ready crops. So now with the cotton, all they have to do is plant the cotton, let it come up, spray the entire field with Roundup, fill everything but the cotton, and then there's nothing left out there. And if some aphid or something dares to attack the cotton, they bring in aerial and they can just go because that's a nice area. You can see how easy it'd be to spray that with an airplane. Uh, and that's what they do. So there's essentially nothing left out here except cotton. Uh, 
when I was younger, there were horn toads, road runners. You don't see those anymore. They're not there. There are no pollinators here, which is, for the cotton is, they're lucky because cotton is self-pollinated. And the alternate crop that they use is wheat. It also is self-pollinated. So they can actually grow crops out here without any pollinators. Uh, but it's kind of a sad thing when the monarchs try to make their way back to, they better have a lot of fat stored up so they can make that fly. But otherwise, they're going to have a hard time. But then when they get down here, what do they see? Well, this is right down the road from me on 1488. Uh, new stuff would be going in. Uh, it used to be farmland with pastures and forests. Well, they scraped all that off, completely scraped it off, so that there was no no other original native vegetation was left, or the topsoil, for that matter. So it was scraped bare. Then they put in the houses. And if you look at this, there's perhaps one plant that might be native, the little tree there, I think mm -hmm. that might be another. Mm -hmm. But if any insect dares to try to live in it, it goes down to the bottom, it hits that pile of dive mulch, that's probably going to be lethal. Uh, the black dive mulch is not a good thing for much of any wildlife. And so the grass, of course, it's heavily chemical treated. Uh, they say that our, our lawns in this area and across the country use 10 times more chemicals than the farmers do in their fields. So it's pretty heavily dosed. So what are we going to do about that? Well, here's one of the solutions. Uh, many of you probably went to uh, Doug Calumny's talk, and he talked about what we could do. And that is, he suggests that there's, there's urban suburban <coughs> scenes like that. How if you convert half of that lawn into wildflowers or native plants of some sort, that that would be a really good start. That would correspond to 20 million acres of wildlife in lake habitat. 20 million acres, which is more than all of our national parks combined. So he suggested we call this homegrown national park. He set up a website. If you want to do this, you can go to go to that website, tell them what you're going to do and how many acres you're going to put in it, and you know, it's, it's growing, so he's, he's doing that, and it's a, a good thing, and I think it really shows what, you know, some ground, ground up uh, uh, organization could perhaps do. Uh, he says, you know, it's not just any plant, so there are, there are some plants that are better than others, like oak trees are better than, say, uh, a sable palm, uh, you know, which won't have many, but oak trees will support a lot of different critters, so. Uh, different different plants have have different values, so plant the ones that make a difference. Someone's at the door. This is my starting point. This is this is what my backyard looked like when I moved in. Uh, and the only wildlife there, as I point out before, is my grandson Taylor. And Taylor now has completed college and has a is a responsible young adult. Uh, at that time, that's what it looked like. The, the builder, uh, which Mike knows uh, too well, I think, had scraped off uh, the, all the soil. They put in, uh, uh, filled, filled the backyard with heavy clay that was from a lake that he wanted to put in the neighborhood uh, without permitting. But he scraped it all out, put, a, put all that clay there. And so invasive weeds both came in, and that's, that's why I started with So it's about three foot of really heavy clay. Is my base starting point. And it, of course, killed the trees on the side there because it smothered the roots. I think it gets even slightly. Uh, this is what it looked like, though, this man. Yeah, nice. Uh, and so you can see it doesn't look like the same place. Uh, of course, this is the beauty shot. This is a, this is the best it's ever going to look uh, because this is May, which <coughs> all the wildflowers and what a bloom in May all at once. So, every, you know, everything looks really nice in May, and especially if you have the Menardas. They're, they're one of my favorites, and they, they really do show. So May is a really nice month. It's, it's my second favorite month of the year, is May, because of, just because of the flowers. There we go. Uh, now, when you get to August, August is the trying month. I had to search, whoops, went too far. This is, this is August, and I had to really hunt to find something that was green, because you remember, we didn't have 
it rained for about six or eight weeks, and things were really, uh, the only thing that I found that really looked like it was not minding this at all was the, our native Texas lantana um, and, the, and the grasses. The, the Indian grass, such as this one, and the little blue stem, uh, they were both doing fine. They didn't mind at all. But a lot of things, but most of the, all the wildflowers, the ones that were blooming earlier, they were, they were not so good. Uh, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Oops. No, no, I don't want to point this thing. No, not there. There. Ah, here we go. This is the fall. Fall is my second favorite month. This is actually my first, my first favorite, and then May. But fall with October, uh, the blue mist flowers bloom. This particular one, and it is a butterfly magnet. It brings in all kinds of butterflies. So it is, it is my second favorite. It's just good to go out and walk around and see, see what new is showing up every day. So you can see, you get a, a difference in season progression you get different plants coming along at different times which is i think kind of nice the, the house with a that i showed you earlier with a with an ice green lawn and a one little tree it looks the same all year round <laughs> my yard does not look the same all year round and it's different with plants and it's different with the with the insects and the birds and everything else these are the spring butterflies some of them that you might see uh, uh, and, and in March, there's not that many, maybe 20 species, 30, 30 butterflies. So that means, you know, you'll see, see any, any particular butterfly, you'll probably only see one, maybe two of them. Not very many. So it's, it's kind of thin, but they're different. They're, they're different butterflies that you may not see later on. Okay. Uh, these are the summer ones. Uh, this is, this is... Uh, I'm not sure what I did there. Let's see. What happened? Oh, there we go. We came back. We came back to something. The back one? Okay. Oh, well, well, well we're, we got fall butterflies here. Well, okay, here's the summer butterflies. There you go. Where is it? I'm going to put it on this. Oh. So it's to Okay, let's try that. Okay. Okay, these are, the, these are the summer butterflies. These show up in May, uh, and they persist right into the fall. So you'll see these guys in the, in the summer. And then we get the, the fall ones. I'm not sure what it's, it's it seems to be. It's a lag. It's a lag, doesn't it? There it is. Okay, I haven't figured out that lag. <laughs> okay, where is it? Uh, but again, okay, these are, these are the fall butterflies. These are some that come up from the from the valley, you'll see that those you get you get different butterflies in the fall. You get the summer winter coming along, and then you get some migrants that come in from the from the south of the expander region. There's where population moves and they come up a little bit this way. And then you get the monarchs who come in a stack on top of from the northeast from the north. So you get just lots of butterflies. So then you may get four hundred butterflies on a, out there on a given day. Looks a lot more interesting when there's a lot of butterfly. Okay, so that's my spiel on why you want to do natives. Uh, first, the wildlife requires you know the birds eat the bugs, and if you don't have the bugs, you don't have the birds. You probably don't have anything because they're essentially the bottom of the food chain. The plants, the bugs are the bottom, and if you don't have that, well, we could have weed and stuff. It wouldn't be a very interesting world without the rest of it. Uh, you don't need any insecticides or fertilizers. In fact, you really should not use any insecticide in your butterfly garden. It's really not nice to invite them in and kill them. So you don't do that. Uh, don't, if you've got milkweeds, don't spray them. Uh, find a different way. Uh, you really don't need any insecticide. You should be very low fertilizer, if any. I don't use any fertilizer in my backyard. Reduced or no watering. Uh, if you don't use any watering in a summer like this, you may have plants that look kind of dead. Then I did, but I didn't water them, so they're going to come back. But they look pretty bad. But if you want, if you do it in the front yard instead of the backyard, like I do it, with that you're you're you may that'll be a that'll be a, a difference. It you know if the neighbors are really going to say, well, you've got a bunch of dead plants. Uh, <laughs> maybe you want to water it just a little bit, just enough to keep them green. Uh, 
seasonal variation. That's one thing I want. You get different, you get different plants or different flowers. It looks different year round, and you get different insects year round. So you get a variation. There's always something different. You can go out and wander around and see something different in the yard. And finally, I think it's, it's relaxing. I don't, I don't, you know, just in the evening, I like to go wander around, see what's going on. Uh, being introduced out to the weeds or doing something like that is, you know, a mindless task like that. It's not, not all that bad if it's out in your garden. But, you know, it's just different. Uh, I, I, there we go. Okay. Uh, how to build your railroad. Okay, first first, just consider, do you have deer in your, in your area? Okay, if you don't have deer in your area, go to step two. Uh, if you do have deer, then you have to make a, make a choice. Uh, do you want to live with the deer, or do you want to exclude the deer? Uh, I decided to split that. My front yard is open for the deer, and so I limit my plant selection. The backyard is fenced off, so the deer don't get <laughs> into it. So I can use whatever I want back there. So I, I have both, though. I, but the front yard has got a pretty good selection of plants. If you're careful, you can you can plant some things that the deer don't like to eat. And you know, it doesn't take a big fence. I want to this tall will keep them out unless as long as you, your neighbors have something growing that they like to eat. <laughs> uh, a sunny area is 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 needed uh, because if you want good flowers, they, they really need sun. Uh, and the butterflies need sun too because the early bird gets the worm, but the early bird also gets the butterfly if the butterfly is too cold to fly. Mm -hmm. And so the butterfly needs the sun to warm its wings so that it can fly and get ahead of the birds. So a sunny area is important for the flowers, it's also important for the insect. Uh, for number three there, just, just make it however you want it to look, but make it easy on yourself when you're doing the mowing thing. I leave a strip about like this between the beds. Sometimes it gets a little smaller, sometimes a little wider. But usually if I go around with a mower each bed, then the mowing is done. It doesn't take much. Um, and uh, keep a little border around it. That, that helps too. Uh, when you're first doing it, you want to strip the vegetation. There's lots of ways to do that. I did it the hard way with a shovel. And it's just scraped it all off. Uh, because you don't want to have Bermuda grass left behind. If Bermuda grass is in there, you will probably never get it out. Uh, so if you want to get it out up front, get rid of it. Um, because it's really hard to get that kind of thing out. Um, get the, the topsoil, uh, a nice little layer like this. If you've got good topsoil, you can skip that. But I had the clay, and so I had to get some of those, like, like growing stuff on brick or concrete. So, but if you got good soil, that would be better. <laughs> it might be a little bit. Oh, never mind, Mike. Sorry, Mike. Um, <laughs> um, but anyhow, the topsoil the better. It, you know, you can get good topsoil. Uh, this is this is probably the place to spend the money if you want to spend spend money. Don't don't get buy expensive plants and put them into crummy soil. Better to get some good soil and get some get some decent plants, and they'll they'll do better. Uh, I have horse manure because I've got a neighbor that has horses and he's happy to get rid of the byproduct. Uh, you want to get as much, the idea is just to get as much organic material mixed in with the soil as you can. Uh, places like Nature's Way Resources, they've got good soil, uh, so you, you can just probably use their stuff straight. But mine was not that good. I got it from across the street where the yard <laughs> was, and it was cheaper, and so I just mixed in the, the horse manure, and it works fine. Uh, you need to put some mulch on it to help pre preserve moisture and to uh, you know get a keep keep the soil from baking uh, and cut down on wheat propagation so you you want to you want to put some mulch down or at least it's a good idea uh, I use pine straw where I can my neighbor sometimes bag it up for me put it up on the street <laughs> so I go around the block and I can, I can get ahead of the garbage truck and I can pick that up and use it uh, you can use well-aged hardwood uh, mulch don't get the stuff from Home Depot or Lowe's uh, especially don't get the dye stuff. Uh, it's, it's not good for the plant. It's not good for anything. Just get it, get it from a reputable uh, mulch yard or dirt yard. Uh, and again, uh, get the stuff that's that the, the, the most rotten you can get is the best. Uh, uh, usually they, they try to get, push it through pretty fast. If you go out and look at it and ask them, well, where, where's your old stuff? Sometimes they'll, 
Okay. Yeah, we've been waiting wanting to get rid of that old stuff, but that's the best stuff you can get. Uh, for the plants, uh, local natives are the best. Uh, they're hard to find. Uh, you guys know we're going to have a plant sale coming up on the 8th. Uh, so, and you can get some at Mercer uh, on the 1st. So we've got two plant sales coming up where you can get native plants. They're, they're both good, and I plan to get both. Uh, use, use trees and shrubs uh, for uh, windbreak shelter. And some of them are host plants. Uh, they're just, you've got to, you can't just have the wildflower, just a flower bed. You need to have the other things that go with them. Because for one thing, where borders or edges, edge, edge effects come into play, where you've got a, uh, a prairie and it comes up to the edge of the forest, that interface right there will be where there's the maximum wildlife. Uh, just because it's the two ecosystems essentially coming together, and you get get things from both right at that spot. So if we're out with you on a tromping through the woods or something going on the butterfly count. I always try to go right along the edge. Yep. He's out tromping through everything. But I try to stick to the edge where it's easier to walk in. And I think there's more butterflies. But we, we work at it. Q finds more Q finds more than I do. But but it's it's a way of it's a, just an approach. I stay on the trails more than you do, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, and finally, you know, use a, use a border for a weed control up here. Most of us live in uh, neighborhoods that have a HOA or something of that sort. Uh, and they, they get upset if it looks like they're not doing this the way they want. So if you put a nice little border around things, it really will look, look like it's on purpose and it'll look pretty decent. And you can do a lot of things that way. And finally, educate with signs. Uh, I use several different signs. These are some I have on my, my gate to let people know that, hey, nice. we're trying to do this on purpose. There's a reason for it. And these organizations, they're all happy to sell you a sign for about 25 bucks or so. Mm -hmm. And they're happy to, happy to sell you a sign that you can put on your gate. And let people know that you're doing this on purpose. Now this is, I told you about starting. This is where I started. This is, I've scraped off the, the soil. There's, you can see it's all bare down here. That's got now the topsoil has come in, so that's the pile of topsoil. I've left I've left a perimeter around where I can just go around with the mower, and it's rounded corners, so I don't have to have a zero turn mower. So it's it makes it all all better. Next comes a layer of horse manure, from my neighbors compliments the camp and the horse, <laughs> and then pine straw is coming on next, and so this is the third step, and then. Next, you just plant. I've already started planting here before I got ahead of myself a little bit, but I already started planting. Sometimes it's hard to uh, and, and then this is this is actually two springs later. I, I meant to get a one the next spring, but this when you see it's this filled in, and it fills in pretty solid. That's what nature does. Nature nature doesn't leave any spaces in between. It's kind of a solid. You know, it's hard to get through, but. There's, I still left, have the path there where I can mow and get through. And you can see I've left a border to make it look like, okay. And that, that gives you a, a head up, heads up on when the, when the Bermuda grass is trying to snake across. You can see it and you can intercept it. So you need to be able to, to get it before it gets in there. Now, plant selection is the next step. Um, I want to talk about this. Uh, keystone plants is the concept that Doug Callum was suggesting. Uh, but there are some plants that are better than others, and these are these are the ones that I think are really good for this area. The the oaks, uh, hackberry. I think hackberry around here is probably my number one, but because it it is just a, a great tree for birds and insects and everything. But you know, willow, cherry, elm. Most of our native trees are pretty good. The pine tree is one that's not quite so good, it, but it does have one butterfly that it harvests, uh, so it's not not a total loss. And the squirrels like the pine cones, you know. Yeah. Hey, it provides the pine straw for my yard, so I, it's all good. Uh, understory trees, all calls and spice bush, red book, prickly club. Those are all host plants as well. That's why I chose those. Uh, but they are there's trees that are not as big as the first batch. They go down a, a level. 
And then there's shrubs and things. I did a list of separate shrub ones, but there are some shrubs that I like. Uh, native grasses, those are my two favorites. Uh, blue stem. Blue, little blue stem and uh, Indian grass. And then the annuals and perennials, you know, the golden eye, milkweed, bee bark. There's, there's a whole bunch of those. Uh, when you get down to the nectar plants, pretty much any nectar plant, you know, it's good. Uh, but these are, these are some that are especially good. Oh, there again. Okay, hackberry tree. This is one. It has essentially all these butterflies are kind of associated with hackberry trees. The first three over here on this side exist, or their caterpillars eat only hackberry. So if you don't have a hackberry tree, forget those three. And those two on the bottom there, they are ones that eat on these. The caterpillars will will use the hackberry tree, but not exclusively. There are other there are other plants they will use, but but they, all five of those, will use it as a host plant for the caterpillar. And the little guy over there, the little great purple hair streak, if you have mistletoe hanging up in the top of your hackberry tree, which a lot of times you do, that is the host plant for that little butterfly. So you need to have mistletoe if you want him. So it's kind of a, and that's a that he's like a little flying gem. He's a beautiful little butterfly. Wait for it, wait for it. No, okay. Oh, there, okay, there it is. <laughs> uh, this is the black cherry. Two butterflies from this one, uh, the tiger swallowtail and the red spotted purple. You can see how the us lepidopters, we like to name things, you know, kind of makes sense. Tiger swallowtail, red spot, those are, the, they, I think they're kind of orange spots. They could have named it up orange spotted purple, but, but it, anyhow, it has this red spot, reddish spots on it. Uh, caterpillars are kind of interesting looking. This one kind of has a snake look. The other one is more of the, uh, uh, bird poop design with antlers. <laughs> but I'm not sure what the antlers are for, but I think that must be make it difficult to swallow. Uh, <laughs> that, that's the only thing I can figure. But it's, those are on that one. This is the giant swallowtail. It's, it's host plant. Hercules Club is common around here, especially out in the western parts of Montgomery County. Uh, you'll see it along the fence roads. The farmers you know, around here, they, they haven't gotten to where they're plowing all the way up to the road, and they leave a fence row, and so you'll see the see these growing along the fence row. Well, that's the butterfly that likes that particular uh, particular little tree, and the caterpillar is this little guy down here. He looks like a big bird poop. Uh, he he doesn't hide underneath the leaves like most caterpillars do. He'll be right on top to enhance the effect of yeah the bird just left me there. Uh, so I, I guess that must be the plan. Anyhow, he, he doesn't seems to seems to survive that way. So it, it must be working for him. But he's an ugly looking thing. Now this one is this one's one of my favorites. The, the spice bush. Uh, it's this this little tree. It likes it. A little bit of sun, a little bit of shade, just kind of on the edge, uh, and it'll grow to about probably 10 feet tall, and it's bushy, so for the, I guess that makes sense with the name, spice bush. The butterfly is real pretty, but the reason I really like it is the caterpillar. I think he's really unique. He's a little green fellow with these big, big bluish eyes. The first time I saw one of these, I know I was about this tall, and I ran in and told my mom, says, there's, a, there's this horrible snake out there, and I think it's probably a, a cobra. And, <laughs> oh, and she, well, she had a big joke out of that. But if you look, I think I was not too bad. Yeah, not too far off. Oh, you know, yeah. it, that it, it's got a pretty good, yeah, sure. pretty good uh, resemblance to that little Texas green snake. <laughs> <laughs> But anyhow, that, this is this is one of the one of the shrubs that does well in our Texas sun. Uh, if you, you need some low lower stuff, so this is one of the low things. Uh, butterflies like the blooms. It around here it doesn't have doesn't serve any particular host capacity, but it is is good for butterflies for nectar plants. Here's a here's a couple more. Uh, this one, the flame acanthus, is supposed to be a host plant for that Texan crescent. I have not actually seen that. Uh, it's just rumored, as far as I know. And the, the bee brush is a good nectar plant, mostly for bees, as the name suggests. Is that why it's blue? Yes. Okay, thank you. And this one, this is a, this is the picture I took just a couple weeks ago. It's, 
And it just lapped you around. Uh, it, this is this is maypop. It's very tough. Uh, that's the butterfly that it uses it as a host plant for the caterpillar. Um, when the caterpillars, <laughs> as they grow, you know, they have to shed their skin because they have exoskeletons and they only stretch so far. So uh, all, most caterpillars go through five separate caterpillar stages, and each one can look a lot different. So this guy, he has just crawled out of his skin. And what they do is they, they spin the silk wherever they go as a caterpillar. They, they're always spinning silk. And so he spins a little patch of silk, grabs a hold of it with his back legs, or actually they're pro legs, you can see. His real legs, is, like most insects, he's got six legs. They're all up here at the front end. The back is just a steering mechanism and holding on there. So, uh, he's, he's just crawled out of his skin there. And so you can see he's very soft and fragile looking there. And they, they have to wait a little while to toughen up. But then once they toughen up, uh, they don't waste anything. Here he is. He's going to eat the skin now. So, but, you know, when they, when they hatch out their eggs, the, the little caterpillar usually eats the eggshell. Well, they learn from that, and he eats the, the skin that he has just shed. Uh, it takes him about a half hour to chew that because it's kind of tough. But he, he worked his way through it. And they don't, you know, nature doesn't waste anything. Uh, everything gets recycled and reused. It, it's, always, it's always used. There's, there's nothing left over. And that's why we need to not lose any, any particular thing because anytime you lose a part of this machine we call the environment, it's a little less efficient. And so we don't want to lose them. Uh, this, is, this is one of the native grasses I like. This is low blue stem. And I put the little dragonfly there because they love to perch on the top of the bloom stalks. And they'll sit up there and they patrol their area. And if you watch them, they'll usually come right back to that same spot. Uh, so you can set up and take a picture of it if you want, if you want to do that kind of thing. How high is it? About like this. Okay. Uh, the... Yeah. Uh, this is one of our milkweeds. This is the green milkweed. It's the one that has uh, been the primary food for the monarch as it makes its way up through our part of the country uh, in the spring. Uh, this one is one of about 35 or 36 native milkweeds of Texas. Uh, we have about a half a dozen that grow here in our area. And this is a host plant for both of those uh, monarch and queen uh, butterflies. Now, this is another of our milkweeds here. This is the aquatic milkweed. And if you've got a really wet area, this is a good, good plant for a wet area because it likes to keep the water. It grows right on the edge of ponds or creeks or streams or anything. It grows right on the edge. So it, it doesn't mind occasionally getting muddy and getting flooded. It's unique among our milkweeds as far as I know. And the seeds that you see over there, notice they don't have any silk. They don't, they're not wind dispersed. They don't, they don't get picked up by the wind and dispersed. They drop into the water and they're cut like a little canoe and they float down the stream and they go somewhere else and they start to plant there. So they don't have, there's no silk on them, and they're cut so they can just float away. Uh, it's interesting how nature designed some of these things. You know, it's like, hey, they're thinking about how to do that. Uh, milkweed insects, if you have milkweed, you're going to have milkweed insects. Uh, these are the ones that are normally around here. Uh, these are all pictures from my backyard of the different ones that are showing up. Um, and you'll get them all. Um, eventually, you'll get them all anyway. And the, they don't. They're not going to kill your plant. They're not going to hurt it. So don't spray them, uh, and don't don't mess with them too much. Uh, you can pick them up. Pick them. Sometimes I squash some of the seed bugs, or I pick off some of them, and it looks like they're chewing up a lot of it. And I'm afraid there won't be anything left. But they won't kill it. Uh, there is another one though that has shown up, uh, and that is this guy. He's a little bit more more troublesome. Uh, this one. The milkweed hasn't had time to adjust to him because he came over to the Americas from Europe with the oleanders. And so this is actually an oleander aphid that's in the same plant family and has the same uh, chemical in it that they use to protect themselves. That's why oleanders are poisonous, milkweeds are poisonous in the same way. So this is the, this is the, they're taking advantage just like all those other insects do about the milkweed uh, having these uh, poisonous chemicals in them. But the ladybugs will eat them. The ladybug larvae will eat them. And there's a little hoverfly over here. His larvae up there, that little green guy, he's like a little green paint. He goes right down the skin and just devours him as he goes. He is really a good one. Uh, 
this, he's the one that he pretty much keeps them off the microwave. If I don't use anything on the on the milk, I don't have to spray them or squash them or do anything. Uh, this one guy keeps them cleaned off. So just be patient, and you'll probably get this little guy showing up. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the plants. These are going to be some of the flowering plants from the spring, uh, end of the fall. So this is after the blue bonnets and the and the uh, little uh, lettuce leaf coreopsis come up and blue in the spring. These are these follow in shortly afterward, and this is some of the monardas. And one of my favorites is this, this tall giant cone flower. A uh, beautiful plant uh, has a little gray, silvery green foliage, so really, really pretty, and just a, just an outstanding plant. This is one you want to plant where where you know it'll be either behind something or in the middle, or you can walk around it. So it's a it's kind of a specimen plant because it gets so big. We have these. This is the more common one around here. Uh, this is the Texas cone flower. Uh, You'll see it growing along roadsides around the, the neighborhood, um, but it's it's pretty abundant around here. Not not rare at all. It's, it's very very common. Uh, these are mostly pollinated by bees. And then my favorite, the monardas here. They're they're really pretty. There are three different kinds of monardas here. There's a white one back there in the back. That's Lindheimer's. This one up to the front is the lemon mint or lemon bee balm. And then over there at the Fistulosa uh, uh, wild bergamot. So they're all all good, and they bloom at the same time. Give the really nice show. Uh, butterflies love them. The bees like them. Even the hummingbirds go for them. So, these are not host plants. These are not host plants. These are nectar plants. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the ones that I'm showing now, unless I, whoops, I'm trying to make it. Uh, probably messed this one up. Anyhow, this is this is the Texas bird parsley. Yeah, you know, that's what I thought happened. <laughs> Get back to Texas very freshly. Here he is. Um, it's a host plant for this guy, the black swallowtail. And that little guy looks kind of like a monarch caterpillar. Some people sometimes told me, hey, I've got a monarch caterpillar on my car. So it's a, no, it's, it's something else. Uh, this is what else it is. Uh, but it's a, it's a very, very pretty thing. Uh, you, you touch him up here on the, on the top of his back, and he puts out these stink horns. And, this one is really smelly. Most of the other swallowtails do the same thing, but they're not as stinky as this one. This one's really, this one really has it perfected. Uh, he's the skunk of the butterfly thing. <laughs> now this is the, the two cone flowers that I like here. The one, the one here on the, on the left is the one that grows up in the national forest right up here, and it's thick. I have tried growing it. With no success, uh, it likes it in sandy soil under pine trees. I don't have that situation. Uh, mine are out in the sun, and the purple cone flower on the right does very well out in the sun, and it, it does really well for me here. Both of these are host plants, potential host plants for the silver checkers. Nice little butterfly in this area. This, where the, the nectar is in the, in the cone flowers. It's not down there where the petals are, and you can see these butterflies have figured it out. It's out here in the middle. It's in the cone, and all the nectar is down in these little crevices between. Now uh, that's one buckeye you can see. It's got notches out there. That probably means it had an encounter with a bird. And those eye spots tend to confuse the birds. They don't know which end to attack. And so it, the butterfly escaped from this particular one. And those are, you can see it's kind of a symmetrical chop, like a, like a bird beat. Uh, these are some of the, you know, moving into the summer. These are some that come up a little bit later. Uh, the blazing star. I've got one, one kind of, one kind of a, uh, layoutress that's just now blooming, but uh, the other one, that one particular one, is already finished blooming. These are these are all good plants. These are the mist flowers we were talking about. Uh, different kinds of uh, blue mist flowers earlier. Uh, we have three that do well here. Uh, the, the wild adgeratum, I call it, or psilocybin. Uh, that one is is the one that's common around here in the along the roadsides. Uh, the Greg's mist flower is from central Texas, and the fragrant mist flower is from a little bit further south, usually down in the valley. But all three do well here. Uh, um, 
they'll just they'll do wonders for you. They bloom at different different times of the year. So if you have all three, you can have a, a really good uh, nectar source any time of the year. Now the the grapes in this flower, at least, and I believe the fragrant this flower, both have this precursor that Patty and I were talking about earlier that will actually give the uh, male butterflies uh, an advantage when it comes to courting the ladies. They, it makes a is a precursor to a pheromone. So the butterflies that come in and fall, the, the queen and the monarchs, uh, when you look at the, what's on these flowers, it usually will be the males. Uh, I have tagged them in the fall, and it runs about 80% male, and that's over about 2,500 records at least. Uh, so it's like 2,000 males, 500 females uh, over 20 years. So. It's that kind of thing. So there's definitely there's something going on there. Now this is another one. This is blooming right now. Beautiful, beautiful flower in this area. It likes it a little wet, but it survived. It seems like blooming now for me. So it survived the summer without any additional rain or water or anything. Um, the painted lady butterflies like this one. This is a nectar plant, not a host plant. And then this, this is our, one of the fall, classic fall butter, uh, uh, wildflower, uh, golden rod. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, they get sneezing from it. This is not the one that causes sneezing. That's the ragweed. It has to be blooming about the same time. Uh, this has good sized pollen grain. It's not going to be the one that causes you trouble. This little beetle loves the, loves the golden rod. Uh, it's, it's larvae eat on small insects and things. That, the adult eats the pollen and is just happy on the on the goldenrod, along with a lot of butterflies and other things. But the goldenrod is a is a great. Uh, it's one of the one of Doug Talby's uh, one of his keystone plants. Mm -hmm. that, uh, he says this is one that you have. So I had have one. Uh, this is my helper for the fall. Uh, this is my granddaughter Sylvie. Uh, she helps me tag butterflies, tag the monarchs when they come through. The flower behind you, you see, that's the swamp sunflower. It's a mm -hmm. fall blooming, and it'll be blooming in another probably two weeks. Uh, it'll be blooming, uh, and it's it gets about six foot tall. Uh, I usually cut it back in August to knee high. This year I didn't have to cut it back. Um, it was just a dry. But this is a beautiful plant. Likes it wet. Uh, this is one you could share with a friend. Uh, or someone you really don't like, but because it grows underground and it comes up and it will take over a bed. You see how thickly it's grown into that particular bed. It take, takes it over and it'll, it'll be the only plant in that bed probably. So if you have to kind of, you know, gotcha. give it a spot. Uh, you can, it, it doesn't, doesn't go down deep, so it's not hard to pull to change your mind. But, it's, but that also makes it easy to share. But Sylvie's a good helper. Uh, there's there's the, successful, the successful catch. Uh, she's got one of the monarch there has been tagged. The other one, she happened to catch those both in the same swoop of the net. So that was the Gulf River. We didn't tag that one, but she was happy with that. She is a sweetie. There's, there's, the, there's the blue mist flower in the fall when the, when the monarchs are coming in. And you can see they're just, just thick on it. They love it. And they're they're very happy with it, and so that's that's what I like for those. And this guy, if you ever wondered what what bees think or what bird they think, that, this is what I think he was thinking. He, he looked like he was kind of upset and, and didn't want to be messed with. So uh, this flower is mine. I think that's what he was telling me. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's, that's well, I've got some handouts here that have host plants, caterpillar host plants for our area. So please take one and share them. That's what I've got. Awesome. Thank you, Don. I think Mike has it. You had something going. You said I had to put it up this time. <coughs> Hey, Mike, are you ready to take over? More questions for Dawn? Oh, yes. Who has questions? 
questions? If there are questions, I have the answers. He, he might have <laughs> answers. Let's see if there's but anything. If there's okay, here's a question. Are there any plants that are good to grow for, to encourage the bugs that want to eat the aphids? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any, but... <laughs> But, you know, you know, if, you plant, plants. if you plant a lot of things, you'll probably have the bugs that will balance it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good to know. I just, I just, I just plant a whole variety. Okay. Yeah. You talked about when you spray cans. Mm -hmm. How did you physically do that? Are we talking machine or? No, I'm talking about me uh, and, a, and a shovel with a. Okay. Yeah, right. it, 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 tedious and long. It sounded like a lot of work. It was. It was. You only want to have to do that once, which is why I said, do it completely. Mm -hmm. Be thorough. Be thorough. How deep did you go? I mean, just enough to get through the roots. The, and my and that heavy clay, the roots weren't that deep. Hey, yeah, Patty. Where, where you have the uh, Leonardo planted? Is there anything else planted with it, or it blooms and dies down, and that's it? Uh, Pretty much, I mean, you know, some things move around. Yeah. And once it dies down, it sprouts up again from the bikes. So I'm just thinking about in, in a flower bed in my front yard. I don't want it to be beautiful and then nothing. I mean, just. That was kind of a question I had too. Like, how do you manage the transitions right. when one group you have mass plantings that are flowering or dying out? Sometimes the actual plant dies down. That's, like, that's why I like some of the grasses. The grasses. Compens compensate for a lot of that. Uh, the, okay. the tall grasses will kind of fill in, and you can leave them in the winter too. Mm -hmm. and they, they provide some shelter for a lot of the insects mm -hmm. and small animals and things like that. So uh, the tall grasses are really nice, the bunch grasses. Okay. <coughs> are there any questions online? Okay. I don't see anything in the chat yet. <coughs> All right, if no more questions, we have a contest now and I'm gonna do an experiment. So if everybody would <clears throat> unmute that's remote, because uh, you're gonna need to be heard. So whoever ever gets the answer first wins. And uh, we only have one prize, so we're gonna award it based on judgment and uh, the <laughs> Decisions of the judges are final. All right, so everybody unmuted. Who we got? Sherry, not unmuted. Darlene, maybe. Okay, so now I'm going to try to share my screen. If I screw okay. up, you're going to see the answer, and it won't be much of a contest. But here we go. Uh, here we go, right there. Okay, so this is a... Wait, is it coming no, across no, yet? No, 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 I'm not seeing it. Just a second. How about that? Still has a killer bee. No, it still has the bee. Nope, nope. nope. nothing yet. Papa, Papa Baton 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 Bush. Bush. I see Button Bush. Is that part of yours? <laughs> that's not his. No, that's not mine. Okay. You should. <clears throat> I may have to do this verbally if it doesn't. Uh... <laughs> well, Let me close this. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Now it says, who am I? I see. Who am I? Yeah. Who am I? Okay, that's it. Who am I? Okay, me, is everyone at home seeing who am I? Yes. Yes. All right. So here's okay. your here's your uh, here's your uh, clues. So first clue is I'm native to the Pines and Prairies eco region. So that's uh, I don't see anybody hitting their buzzer yet or shouting it out. <laughs> My seeds are dispersed by blue jays. Whoa. Any guesses? Oaks. Okay, so you have to be specific. You're gonna to have to have um, Rex Myrtle. Oh, whoops! In the movie Shawshank Redemption, Andy hit a note for Red, directing him to Zywa Mayo under me. White Oak. Bingo! Who has said that? Jody. Jody, you have won the grand prize. <laughs> All right. I think J Jody, I think you're remote, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so the prize is a copy of uh, Sarah Dykeman's book. No way! It's, yeah. That's awesome! So, so um, <laughs> if you're going to go to her talk or if you're going to come to the uh, potluck, 
I am. Uh, okay, well, it will be waiting for you at our place when you come to the potluck, so you can that's, have her sign it. That's so awesome. Thank you. I actually did the book on Audible and didn't buy the book and was going to buy it so that I could have her sign it, and now I don't well, have to. Yeah, you don't have to. So uh, uh, as we close, I do want to make a special thank you to Carolyn Lang Langlinay. In the night, uh, I started feeling puny. I took some cold remedies and tested the positive for uh, COVID this morning. So I was in big time scramble mode. And I sent out a call and who comes through? Carolyn Langlinay. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, you are invaluable. And uh, I do want to send out an uh, invite. <clears throat> Ready? Anybody who wants to attend the potluck, just sign up. We'd love to have you at our house. We'd love you have a chance to meet uh, Sarah. And if you can't do that the following night at uh, Spring Creek Nature Center. And we got two great sales coming up. So uh, great chance to get some natives. So thank you, everybody that was able to attend either virtually or in person. It's all right. It's great. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, no, just again, thank you, Mike, for setting all this up and um, for taking the in initiative to have these meetings. Really appreciate you. And get well soon. Yeah, I'll do my best. All righty. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody.